there. Firstly, if you're religious, you live longer. Uh, that puzzles me. I mean, isn't heaven meant to be a nice place? Uh, it's always been... Moses was like 800 <laughs> years old or something like that. Yeah, and, uh, and, then, and then Dinesh says that uh, one reason why people stay religious into old age is because they, they're thinking about life after death. Well, that was Bernie Madoff's mistake. He promised returns in this life. So, you know, <laughs> religion. But, but I'm afraid the thing is that, that most people are brought up in a, in a, a religious tradition and those people who escape religion do it because they look at the facts, they look at the evidence, they look at the morality, they look at the teachings, they look at the world around them, and they recognize that there is something very divisive, very distorting here. Look at small children in a kindergarten. All races and ethnicities and backgrounds and classes and religions, they don't know that. We have to work very, very hard to divide them and tell them what tribe they belong to and what religion they belong to. And that's where the source of the trouble comes in All our right, world, Dinesh from division. Dinesh is to respond. AC said earlier that the defining feature of religion is hierarchy and exclusivity. And I think that on both these, he's giving a very narrow and ethnocentric definition. First of all, Christianity is the only religion in the world that considers another religion, Judaism, to be wholly true. Hinduism considers all other religions to be wholly true. Uh, there's no sense in the Eastern religions of this hierarchy, of this exclusivity. So we're seeing here not an attack on religion, but on a very slice of religion, perhaps fundamentalist religion. I think the deeper point here is this, uh, and that is that the religious guy and the non-religious guy are both responding to the world as it is. Charles Darwin became an atheist not because he discovered evolution. It wasn't facts. It was when his daughter Annie died. And Charles Darwin said, if there's a hell, lots of the lovely people I know would be in it. I can't bear that kind of a doctrine. You, Matthew, in your article in Slate Magazine talked about nuns or, or, or teachers who beat you on the ankles and people, people who stuck their hands down your pants. My point is, in many cases, we're not dealing with facts. We're dealing with wounded theism. Many times when we hear the word atheism, we're dealing with a person who is angry with God or angry maybe with the representatives, the self-appointed representatives of God. That's not real atheism. That, they, too, are conducting, if you will, an ideological war. Otherwise, they All wouldn't right. be here. That's an interesting But Matthew Chapman, are you angry with God? <laughs> um, how can you be angry with something that doesn't exist? I'm angry with Dinesh because he's making these uh, preposterous well, statements my about, my, about my great-great-grandfather <laughs> that, that are simply not true. Um, his atheism didn't come solely from the fact that his daughter died. It was a very slow process of seeing how the theory of evolution was in conflict with the Bible. And I think the point I would make is, is let's give the religious people that at some point in history, religion was helpful, that it did make people do better things, but that the texts that these things, that the religions are based upon, are archaic, um, absurd, cruel, open to interpretation, and frankly, there are better ways of conducting yourself in life. There are, and people like myself and, and, and Anthony here, we don't find a problem with being moral without God. Right, and I don't go. buy this argument that we've inherited it from Christianity because if you look at the sort of evolutionary world, empathy and cooperation and compassion clearly existed before God decided for All some right. unknown reason let to me, intervene. Let me take it to David Wolpe to t talk about this question of the text. And you're in an interesting position because in 2001, you, you gave a talk in which you actually questioned the literal truth of, of the Exodus right. story. So you, you, are not, you are already not tied to I'm not to a literalist, text. no. But, but what I find very interesting is the, the leap that Matthew's making. He says these texts have cruel things. There are better ways to behave. But we're asking not would the world be better off if you rewrote the Bible, but would the world be better off without the influence that religion has on religious people? Mm -hmm. And I tried again and again to say, this is what religious people do, this is what religious people do, this is what religious people do, only to get back, but look at the terrible text. And I want to say in response to what, to what Anthony said, I have the exact opposite experience. I actually think that if you believe that people are fundamentally good, and if you leave them alone, they're just going to be good, then you've never visited a playground. <laughs> because my experience is when a new kid comes to the playground, the other kids don't go, oh, look, a new child. <laughs> Let us embrace him and share our toys. <laughs> Actually,
Actually, children have to be socialized to good. They do, and it takes a lot of work. If any of you are parents, do you have to tell your kid, don't share so much, don't be so nice? No, quite the opposite. And that work is difficult work and constant work, and that's what religious communities do. Do they ever do harm? Of course they sometimes do harm. Are there texts I don't like? Of course. But the coda to this is this idea that religious people are thoughtless automatons that follow what the text says does violence to everything I know about religious training, about religious leaders, about religious people, and, by the way, about the fact that we're having a debate like this tonight. Let me go to I, the other. I, I would like to intervene uh, on this. Because, all right, very quickly. Because I, I think what he's saying is this, is this is the viewpoint of a rabbi who does work in an affluent community in Los Angeles. Both these men are very sophisticated. The people I met in Pennsylvania, who 50% of them believe in, in, creation, in creationism and are fundamentalist, are people these, see, people, the, these people they ignore. They're saying we ignore their sophistication. I'm saying they ignore the fact that most of the world is fundamentalist and takes a barbaric view of many of the texts. And, and, well, and, and if, the, if there were no religion, what would be happening in Pennsylvania? In other words, it, what's the harm in the Pennsylvania situation where the school board wanted uh, in, uh, create, uh, intellig an intelligent design taught as an equal alternative to evolution? You, you've got to specify what the harm is there. Well, the harm is absolutely enormous. I mean, 50 percent, I mean, just to be practical about it, 50 percent of the growth of the American economy since World War II has come from science and technology. And this anti-scientism is gradually eroding America's ability to produce enterprising, educated... Okay, I want, that's a new point that I want to take to this side. The argument that, that religious thinking and religious strictures limit science, Galileo, into the future. Go ahead. First of all, if you were to make a list of the 200 greatest scientists of all time, uh, from Newton, Cop Copernicus, Kepler, Pascal, Gassendi, um, Boyle, the list goes on, you find that the vast, vast majority of them were religious believers. Moreover, it's not an accident that science did not develop universally. It developed in Western civilization. Why is that? Because in Western civilization, there is an embedded religious idea, and that is the idea of the rational cosmos. Uh, the Muslim philosopher Ibn, um, uh, the Muslim philosopher Al Ghazali denies that the universe operates by laws. He says everything happens because Allah wills it at every given moment. That's why science didn't develop in the Muslim world. It's the sense of the whimsical, the miraculous universe. The point I'm trying to get at here is that on the basis of, a, a, I would say, a 1% minority of religious rednecks, we have an indictment of all the world's religions as a whole. Nothing right. could be more crude and shameful than to imply that Athens and Jerusalem, which have given rise to Western civilization, that have shaped our philosophy, our economy, separation of powers, checks and balances, when Thomas Jefferson... Who right, was Dinesh, not I want to I cut you off to let okay, Anthony Gray. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I mean, the, the, there are two things, uh, uh, Dinesh. With great respect to you, you are the most tremendous rewriter of history I've ever come across in my life. <laughs> I mean, one, you, don't, uh, you don't seem to be conscious of the fact that uh, when Christianity became dominant in Europe at about the 3rd, 4th century AD, uh, it, uh, it looked at its sundial. The parousia, the second coming of the Messiah, hadn't happened. They needed some extra ethics. The ethics of the New Testament and the Pauline epistles are very thin. They're the stuff I talked about earlier. Give everything away, don't get married, don't bother about tomorrow. Where did they get it from? They got it from Greek philosophy. Most of European culture, and that means culture of the West, is deeply rooted in classical antiquity, in the thinking of Socrates and Aristotle and, and the Stoics. That is where our, our European outlook, our cultural outlook comes from. Conceptions of justice, of, of ethics, of uh, democracy, they all come from the pre-Christian state of Europe. Euro uh, Christianity was an oriental religion that inter erupted into Europe and changed the course of European history uh, and derailed it for over a thousand years. People couldn't build a dome like the, the, the dome of Maxentius in Rome because they'd lost the uh, understanding of simple engineering. It wasn't until Brunelleschi's dome in Florence in the 15th, 16th century that that was possible. So we're looking at a, at a phenomenon here where uh, religion did to our forefathers, did to the history of our culture, exactly what Matthew says it's doing again to the prospects for science and progress right. in our contemporary David, world. David very, very briefly, Anthony, I think actually you're the victim of a very parochial education because 
long before Christianity, Judaism enunciated all the ideals that you say did not actually come from religion. In 50 BCE, when, uh, when Hillel was asked to summarize all of Judaism, he said, that which is hateful to you, don't do to others. Um, and, and the sages of, uh, of Judaism were killed by the Roman Empire, not by a religious uh, empire, as opposed to Socrates, who was killed by the Athenian uh, uh, polity that you idealize. They killed their own sages. Uh, in Judaism, we venerated them. And they're actually the ones who seeded Christianity and gave us the morality that you claim came from the Stoics. Anthony. Can I tell David just a quick little anecdote sure. about a conversation I had with a, with a cab driver in London. Cab drivers in London are very interesting folk. I asked this, uh, <laughs> th th this uh, man if he'd read the Old Testament. He said he hadn't. I said, do you remember any stories from the Old Testament? He thought for a moment. He said, yep. I remember something about a woman being turned into a pillar of salt, and I took this to be evidence of some domestic disorder in his own family and wishful <laughs> thinking. <laughs> I said to him, do you remember that story? You know, uh, God didn't like uh, the, the, the homosexuals in Sodom, so he was going to destroy everybody there. Somebody pointed out to him uh, that there might be a righteous person. He sent the angels to tell Lot to get out of the city. The citizens wanted those two angels, the handsome young men. And Lot said to them, you can have my daughters instead. When they finally left the city, what happened? His two daughters didn't have husbands, so they slept yeah. with their father and became the ancestors. Right, we see where you're right. going. I know, I know okay, the story. The By point. the way, yeah. actually, you're, you're, you, you also are the victim of an inadequate biblical education, I think, because <laughs> Sodom was not destroyed because of homosexuality. Read the book of Ezekiel. It was destroyed because of the cruelty of the people of Sodom, their immorality. And, and I really, I think, with all due respect, that, that to cite London cab drivers, um, pithy though they may be, as the, uh, as the demonstration that Judaism didn't actually create the morality of the West may be a little thin. All right. I wanna, it was me I, who was doing I, the I, demonstration. I, I wanna, and Sodom was destroyed, no matter what reason you give to it. I want to go to questions from children. the audience. I want to move on to your questions. And, and recall that I'd like you to be very terse and to really ask a question that's on our motion that moves it forward. But I, before we get to the get all ready for that, I just want to take one, uh, move things in one more direction. To this side, I want to... I want to rephrase what David Wolpe has been saying, is that, is that religion, uh, religion organizes, religion has the capacity to organize the best in us, to do good things, and to transcend ourselves. And, and what he paints is, a, is a, a bleak world without that. So it's undeniable in places like uh, Africa, et cetera, that the en enormous amount of work is done through organized religion. And that's on everybody's mind, so I'd like you to take that on. Well, I, 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 we can share it, but um, most people are religious. So it's not surprising that most people who are out there doing good things are religious. It's the same argument I would make about scientists. Most scientists were Christians. Well, most everybody was Christian, so of course most of the scientists were Christians So too. you're saying there's no cause and effect between no, these things? No, I don't think so. I, I, I think there's lots of, lots Dinesh, of people doing Dinesh good Dinesh things. And all I'll that. challenge that on the basis of this book right here by the sociologist Arthur Brooks. It's called Who Really Cares? And it's a careful study of philanthropy in America. So it's comparing like with like. It divides America into four groups. Religious conservatives, religious liberals, secular conservatives, and secular liberals and it looks at generosity, not just in terms of money, but also in terms of time, and not to religious causes, but to so-called secular causes. It turns out that the most charitable people in America, by far, are the religious conservatives. The second most, uh, the second most charitable are the religious liberals. The third most charitable are the secular conservatives, and the last are the secular liberals. Now, what's particularly poignant about this is the secular liberals in America are the richest. They earn the most money, but they give away the least. So it is not the case that this is a generic matter of people who happen to be religious. The point which David Sloan Wilson made in a recent book is that evolution narrows the circle of our sympathies to our kins or to people from whom we can get something. But when you do things in service to God, you're much more likely to help the stranger, right. the outsider. A very outsider. quick response from the other side, if you want. Okay, I just Anthony want to make Grilling. a point that there are plenty of, of non-religious people who are involved in charitable uh, endeavors, and they don't stay on afterwards because they don't have an extra agenda. And I just want to quote to you... You, what mean, you mean proselytization? Yeah, exactly. And I don't... Uh, uh, I just a want to... Anthony, can you be explicit about but, that? But yeah. Yes, sir, because I, I, I don't think that they're staying on because they haven't got anything to proselytize about. 
Uh, they don't want to return for their investment. Uh, the, George Bernard Shaw said, in this very, very quick quote, he said when he gave up religion, escaped religion as a teenager, he said, that moment was the moment when I felt the 